Well, the middle of that song is so true, isn't it? And hard to do. Silently now, three times, there it says the same thing over and over and over again at the end of that song. Silently now I wait for thee. Oh boy, is that true, you know? Is that true in our lives? And uh, both of those things, silently wait. <laughs> silently wait. And uh, mm, boy, I tell you, don't get rid of the old hymns, that's for sure. Don't get rid of them. Nothing wrong with uh, nothing wrong with new, good, sound gospel music. I'm not saying that, but so much good doctrinal truth in those those hymns as well. Acts chapter 24 there in your Bible. Acts chapter 24. We're going to begin reading in verse number one in just a moment. I got a little note here from uh, Brother Smith, and uh, he wanted to let everybody know that they got to New Mexico safely, no problems, a couple of inconveniences. He said, God was good to us. Praise the Lord. He was in the First Baptist Church of Edgewood uh, on last Sunday. Had the privilege to teach the Sunday school class there. And uh, he also gave us a little weather update. He said it rained, but it didn't amount to much. And he says, my love to everyone. So I thought I'd read that uh, for you there. And uh, that was enclosed with his giving. Faithful to be giving, uh, even though he's not here. So... Uh, praise the Lord for that. Acts chapter 24 and uh, verse number 1 is where we're going to uh, uh, begin to read. Acts 24 and verse number 1. And we're going to read down through verse number 9. And we come to the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts is, of course, there's doctrine that's contained there. Uh, there's uh, much, though, that is narrative. Uh, much that is narrative. We think of the Gospels as doctrinal and historical uh, but Acts is like a running narrative often. And you have that again here in Acts chapter 24. And often doctrine is more implied than it is specifically stated uh, in the book of Acts. Not that there's none that's uh, uh, specifically stated, but it's more implied. And you have that in this narrative as we continue Paul now. Remember where he's at. He's, he's left Jerusalem. And, and now he's in Caesarea. And he's about to appear before Felix. And the Bible says in verse number 1, After five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, See that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us, and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself Make us, may us take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. I want you to think about, as we begin this 24th chapter, I want you to think about the proceedings against Paul, the trial of Paul, really, before uh, Felix. And when we come to the 24th chapter, it's the story of a good man, Paul, but just as much as it's the story of a good man, Paul, it's the story of a bad man, named Felix, and uh, Felix was quite a fellow, and I don't mean that in the good sense of the word. Uh, Felix was a corrupt official. Uh, he uh, married a woman by the name of Drusilla. And Drusilla was married previously. Uh, she was married to a king when she was 15, and uh, Felix wanted her to be his wife, and so he seduced her and seduced her away from her, her husband. And we think about Felix, that's just, a, that's just a brief little synopsis about how Felix is. You can already tell he's a scoundrel of a person. And we think about the, the opportunity, though, that Felix had. What you think about this? The Apostle Paul is held up in the governor's house, which was Herod's palace, and the governor was Felix. And so he was held up there. The Bible says he was held up there for two years. How would you like to have Paul in your house for two years? 
He had Paul in his house for two years. Now you talk about someone that had opportunity. And someone has said that he is probably one of the greatest illustrations of lost opportunity. Lost opportunity. He had every opportunity in the world to hear the truth time and time and time again, and yet he rejected the truth. Maybe the greatest example of lost opportunity, maybe even a step higher than Felix, would be a man by the name of Judas. Judas is scary. Can you imagine being with and being around the blessed Son of God for three and a half years? Judas was with Jesus for three and a half years. And yet, what did Jesus say about Judas? What did... What sent Judas to hell? I tell you what sent Judas to hell. Unbelief sent Judas to hell. That's what sent Judas to hell. You remember what Jesus said about Judas? Good were it for that man if he had never been born. In Mark chapter 14, verse number 21. But Felix is in the mold after Judas. He had great opportunity living there with the Apostle Paul. I mean, there wasn't, uh, uh, in that time, there wasn't any... Uh, a greater witness, no doubt, and greater testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul, at least that we know of, that's written in, in Scripture. Yet, Felix rejects all that Paul stands for. He rejects the truth that Paul uh, proclaimed. He is a story of lost opportunity. When you think about his rule for just a minute, he was the governor of Judea. Of course, Jerusalem encompassed his... Uh, jurisdiction there and so he could hear this case of the Apostle Paul he got his position from his brother uh, who was friends with the emperor that's how he got to be the governor of that area not necessarily because of his great leadership characteristics uh, he he knew people who knew people who knew people you you know how that goes you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back and those types of things and that's how he got to the position uh, to where he was not because of his leadership qualities. If you study history, you find out that his entire uh, uh, time as governor, as procurator, was a troublesome time. Uh, he did manage to do a few little things, stop some riots here and there. Uh, uh, but in one particular case, he stopped one riot and he killed many people and he alienated the Jewish people to a point where he was having a hard time protecting them. Uh, we see him as indecisive. We see him as procrastinating. Uh, but also, as we say this chapter, you're going to find out that Felix was a coward. He was a coward. Now we think about the Apostle Paul, the opposite of Felix. Uh, Felix corrupt, uh, ruled corruptly. Uh, he, he was just the, the picture of somebody that was a, a, a corrupt leader. Then you have the Apostle Paul, a uh, a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find him here. Now, he's left Jerusalem. He's been uh, uh, taken out of Jerusalem. Remember, in the middle of the night, 470 men. And we talked about how God takes care of his servants. And they escort Paul out of Jerusalem in the middle of the night. And they bring him to Caesarea. You remember Claudius, uh, the, chief, uh, the chief captain. You remember, he just, he just could not find out why the Jews wanted to kill Paul so badly. He just could not get an accusation. And so uh, he appealed to, to so many things. And uh, he tried in so many ways. He, he asked the mob first. And the mob, they didn't know. And so he appealed to Paul. And Paul gives his defense of, of what he believes. And when he got done, uh, uh, Claudius being a, a, a lost person, he wasn't discerning what the Apostle Paul was saying. And so he still didn't have an answer. So he thought, if there's no other way to get an answer, then I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll torture this guy. And you remember what Paul said? He said, are you going to torture someone who's a Roman citizen? And so he backs off. And so he results to the next step. And the next step was taking Paul before the Sanhedrin and trying to get the Sanhedrin to accuse him because if it became a, a Jewish matter, it took it out of his hands and he didn't have to worry about it anymore. But you remember what he did to the Sanhedrin. He turned the Sanhedrin on itself. Remember the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees started arguing once uh, 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 against another and uh, so finally he'd come to the, the end of it all and he decided, look, there's, there's no other way to take care of this. We've got to get this guy out of here. And so what does he do? He does what's so often the case. He passes the buck, right? He gives it to the next person and he lets the next person deal with it. And he takes Paul 
and he moves Paul out of Jerusalem in the middle of the night, and he moves him up to Caesarea uh, to appeal uh, to Felix. As we look at this trial in Acts chapter 24, I want you to notice some things. Notice what Paul is doing. Notice what God is doing. And notice what Felix is doing. This is a story. It's a narrative. We just read the first nine verses. And doctor doesn't come leaping off the page at us there. Uh, uh, three points in a poem don't come leaping off the page uh, uh, this evening from this passage right here. But there are many facets to it. And I want you to see Paul's attitude in the midst of this trial and what's taking place. And uh, 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 in the, the tragedy in Felix's life of procrastinating with the gospel. And, and, and see the, the providence of God at work. Uh, uh, see those who have an absolute hatred because of unbelief. See what's going on there in their lives as well. And the hardness of men's hearts uh, uh, to the truth of the gospel. All these different facets are taking place in this trial. I want you to think tonight, really there's only one main point I'm going to bring out to you tonight. We're going to span this chapter out over several weeks. But I want you to think about, first of all, uh, the prosecution that takes place. And that's in these first nine verses. We can divide the passage really into three different parts, the prosecution, the plea, and the pronouncement. And we see the prosecution right here. Uh, uh, Claudius says to Felix, he writes that letter, and he pretty much says, look, this is a matter about Jewish law, so I'm, I'm passing this off to you. It's about Jewish theology, and, and I don't see anything wrong with Paul. I don't see any reason why Paul should be in jail and I don't see any reason why Paul should be killed according to Roman law. This is something about Jewish law, and so I'm passing the book off to you. And so what does Claudius say about Paul? He says, Paul, as far as Roman law is concerned, Paul is what? He's innocent. No, no guilt found in this guy. And he said, look, if you want to pursue this case further, you're going to have to appeal. You're going to have to go on up the chain here. You're going to have to go on up to Felix for this. And the Jewish leaders, they were ready to do that. They weren't content with just having Paul out of Jerusalem. They wanted, to, they wanted him dead. They wanted him out of the way. And you say, how do you know that, preacher? Well, look what the Bible says in verse 1. After five days, Ananias, you remember he's the one that had Paul smote in the face in the previous chapter. The high priest, he was wicked as well, corrupt. He descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. So, they're not content just to leave Paul alone now that he's out of the city. They're coming after him. And they're going to prosecute this to the nth degree as much as they possibly can. And Paul was doing the same thing that his Savior, the Lord Jesus, had done. He, they were so upset, they were so burned up about it. Why? Because he was turning their theology upside down. He was taking their Judaism and turning it on its head and these religious leaders, they couldn't tolerate it. They didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to, uh, they, they didn't want to do that. And knowing that, Paul was seeing Jews come to Jesus Christ. And that really upset them. That was creating a, a problem for them. And Paul looked at those uh, religious leaders and he called them what? He called them hypocrites. Just like Jesus had called them in Matthew 23. And he had called them whited sepulchers. Remember Jesus did whited sepulchers in Matthew chapter 23. And the very person, the very Jesus they had deemed a blasphemer, the very Jesus that they had executed on the cross, Paul was preaching as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God come in the flesh, the Messiah. And that just really got under their skin. And so they come, and here's their, the, the accusers. We see them coming, and we see Ananias. And we've talked a little bit about him already. He was corrupt, high priest. He saw Paul as a threat. He wanted to get rid of him. Then we see another group mentioned in verse number 1. Not only Ananias, but we see the elders. And who were the elders? They were the key leaders out of the Sanhedrin. Out of that 70, they were the key leaders out of them. Uh, if you will, the Supreme Court of the Supreme Court. And so here they come. And they're coming with Ananias, the high priest. And then there's another man mentioned here in verse number 1. And his name is Tertullus. And who is this man, Tertullus? Well, uh, the... Jews, they needed someone that was familiar with Roman law. And so they hired Tertullus, and he was like an attorney. Now, no doubt he was well-versed in the procedures of Roman law and, and how to go about uh, speaking before uh, the governor, such as Felix and others. And so they hire him, and they bring him in. And 
he, he probably s spoke Latin as well. And so they get him to come in. And, and they're going to let him do as any person who's on a trial, uh, uh, if they're smart, right? They let the lawyer do the talking, right? And so that's what they do. They let Tertullus uh, do the talking when they get there. Now, what does Tertullus do? He does something that was very common to do. What does he do? He butters up Felix. Look what the Bible says in verse number 2. When he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, See that by thee we enjoy great quietness. Now let me tell you something. Let me give you a one-word description of everything that Tertullus is telling, telling Felix. You know what that one-word description is? Baloney. Amen. How do you like that? That's in the Greek. Baloney. It's in, the, uh, it's in the Greek there, baloney, right? The fact of the matter is that everything he's saying is just to blow up Felix's ego. That's all it is. And even Felix himself had to know, as Tertullus is speaking, he's probably laughing, saying, what the funniest thing about this is that all these religious leaders have to sit here with a straight face and listen to this guy. Because everything they're saying these religious leaders could never say out of their mouth with a straight face. Because none of it was true. It's all just to blow him up. And that's what they did to those, uh, 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 to those despots in those days and those uh, uh, corrupt leaders. All they did was just blow them. Have you, ever seen, uh, have you ever seen the propaganda stuff that comes out of North Korea and Iran? Uh, uh, you know that, 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 that fellow over there in North Korea... What did they, the one that died recently, what did they call him? I don't know what they call his son now, but they called him what? The deer leader. Haven't eaten in weeks and months, but we're going to call him the deer leader? I don't know about that, right? What is that? Well, it's brainwashing. It's flattery. And on the back side of that, I can tell you what it really is. It's coercion is what it is. You either say it or we cut your throat, one of the two. That's what it comes down to. And that's exactly what Tertullus is doing here. He's, uh, he, he, he's, inflating, he's inflating Felix's ego. What, well, how does he begin to do it? Well, first he talks about there uh, in verse number 2. He says, seeing that we enjoy great quietness. In other words, we have so much peace here in, in our wonderful region here. Can I tell you something that Felix didn't make? You study history. He didn't make any contribution to peace in that area. None whatsoever. Uh, matter of fact, the Jews, the only peace that the Pax Romana, uh, Romanus, I mean, that means uh, 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 the Roman peace, the, the, the only peace that anybody enjoyed during that time was the Romans. The Jews didn't enjoy any peace during that time. And uh, it, it was oppression for the Jews. It wasn't peace. But Tertullus, you know, it sounds good. Uh, uh, so seeing nothing, we enjoy great kindness. And now, no, no, next, the next thing. And that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy province. Great deeds. Well, if he did any great deeds, history didn't record it. Didn't say anything about it. Tertullus, you notice, he doesn't offer any specifics. He just speaks in generalities. Uh, as a matter of fact, you study out a little bit about Felix, you find out that <clears throat> Felix wasn't loved by the Jews. Uh, he assassinated a high priest. You don't win friends and influence people among the Jews by assassinating a high priest. It doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, historians recorded about him, we can give you several illustrations, I don't want to bore you, uh, but historians have recorded about him that he was known as somebody who thought he could get away with anything. That was his testimony. Now look at verse 3. Tertullus continues. We accept it always. Now, now listen, when you say always, that's a strong word. We accept it always. And in, what's the next word? All. That's, that's inclusive, isn't it? Everything, everywhere, all the time. We accept it always in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. That's a lot of absolutism going on there. Everything, all the time, everywhere. And uh, <clears throat> I can imagine that Ananias and those elders are probably standing there going, looking at him like, what are you saying? Are we sure we hired the right guy? 
They're probably standing there in disbelief. Uh, uh, they could never, they could have never said anything like that. And uh, so there they are. And Felix, I'm sure, is hamming it all up because he's thinking these guys have to endure everything this guy's saying. Even he, I believe, knew that it wasn't true. Look at verse number four. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee. In other words, what's he really saying? Let me be brief. He says, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. In other words, he didn't want to go on and on and on and on about how great Felix was. The truth of the matter is, it's not that he had so many good things to say about Felix. He didn't have anything else to say, so he said, I'm going to get right to the point. I can't think of any good things to say, so I'm going to get right to the point. By the way, you find out that orators like Tertullus, they didn't turn out to be brief. They turned out to be often very windy. Uh, the accusation that's laid before him. What's the accusation? Well, we find the accusation in verses 5 through 9. We find flattery in verses 2 through 4. And then we find an accusation that's leveled uh, here against the Apostle Paul. And it falls into different categories as well. Uh, well, what is it? Well, first he said, We have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. So three different things. Uh, uh, what's going on? First of all, they say this guy's guilty of sedition. They use that word there. Sedition. Sedition was violating Roman law. So they're accusing him of violating, breaking the law of Rome. Then they're accusing him of something else. They're accusing him of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Uh, this would be, in other words, a violation of Jewish law. Not only is he a mover of sedition, not only is he trying to stir up a rebellion against Rome, but even among his own people, he's a ringleader of the Nazarenes, of that sect. So it's not only a violation of Roman law, now a violation of Jewish law as well. And then, and notice what it says in verse 6, who also has gone about to profane the temple. Now, not only is there a violation against Roman law and a violation against Jewish law, but he's even profaned the temple, and that's a violation against God's law. So they're going to accuse him in three different areas. Now, by the way, are any of these charges true? No. They're not true. They're false charges. Let's take the first one. The Bible uses the word a mover in verse 5 of sedition. Sedition, let's put it in layman's terms. Treason. In other words, he's what? He's a traitor. He's a traitor. By the way, if they could get that charge to stick, Paul was in deep trouble. He was in deep trouble. Why? Because any sense of treason against Rome was squashed. It was put down in a hurry. Notice the phrase they used about him in verse 5. They said, this man is what? He's a pestilent fellow. What does that mean? That means he's a nuisance. He's a nuisance. In other words, I'll tell you one thing, and let me tell you something. To Ananias and the elders, he was. He was a nuisance. He was a pain in the neck to them. Now, that wasn't an accusation. That was just a general statement uh, reflecting what they thought about Paul. To, to uh, Ananias and the elders, Paul was a pain in the neck. Paul was a nuisance to them. Now, what evidence did they have? Well, they said, look, this guy, he's moving against the government. He's treasonous against the government. He's trying to get the Jews to revolt against Rome. As I said, any of that type of thing was quelled very quickly. Now, granted, granted, of all of the arguments they had, we could say this about that argument, that wherever Paul preached, there was a riot that soon followed. Make no mistake about that. It seemed like every time Paul opened his mouth in Jerusalem, a riot broke out. The Romans were paranoid about those things. Riots, insurrections. And so they would place these rulers and these soldiers in different areas. Remember all those soldiers, those thousand soldiers that was in the fortress of Antonia right there in the temple courtyard? Why? Because of insurrection, because of riot. Now, if they could somehow, if Ananias and these elders could somehow support that accusation right there, uh, it was uh, uh, Paul who was going to have a hard time in that situation because every time, everywhere he went, riots occurred 
after him. However, there was no way they could justifiably accuse him of beginning the riot himself or causing sedition or treason in some way. Uh uh-uh. uh. Now, notice Tertullus. Does he talk about any particular riot? No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't say anything about any particular riot in any specific area. Uh uh-uh. uh. And so, if he goes on to say anything more about it, he's got to be very careful in his words. Because if he says anything about rights in other places, what does that do? They can't enter that as evidence because it might be out of Felix's jurisdiction. He only has certain places. So he's saying it all very vaguely. He's painting it with a broad brush. Why? So Paul wouldn't get moved. So he wouldn't get transferred somewhere else. They had him here. They wanted to to accuse him. They wanted to try him. They wanted to put him to death right here. They wanted an immediate decision. So they bring up this false accusation against Paul. Uh, This particular accusation wasn't just something that was characteristic against Paul, but they would often do that. If they didn't like somebody, they would often accuse them of sedition or treason against the government to try to get rid of them quickly, exterminate them. Let me give you another thought about this. You study, as we've been doing for the last several years now, you study this book of Acts, and as you journey through, as you travel through the book of Acts, Christians are are put on trial for preaching Christ at every bend. No matter what's going on. And we find out that the Holy Spirit takes His Word and He gives it to Luke to pin down. And Luke pins it down in the book of Acts in great detail about these trials. And why? Why not just a general description about it? And then throw in some doctrine at the end. Why why all these narratives? Why tell all these stories? Think about all the trials that are described. Uh, Think about Paul before Galileo and Sergius Paulus and Felix and Festus. And then he's going to continue on to Agrippa. Uh, uh, Think about at the beginning of the book of Acts and Peter and John. And there they are on trial before the Sanhedrin. And, And Luke goes into great... Uh, uh, specifics about these trials and telling us about them. Why does he do that? The Holy Spirit is very careful to point out the details of each of these trials of Christians all the way throughout the book of Acts. Why? Because he wants to make it abundantly clear that they were innocent of any violation of the laws of the land. In other words, he wanted to make sure that people understood that Bible Christianity wasn't something that moved against the government. It wasn't a treasonous movement against the government. It it, it wasn't something that people could accuse. Those Christians, uh, uh, they are always against the government. Political treason. No, the Bible is explicit about that. That's not Bible Christianity. That's not it at all. Matter of fact, you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, render therefore, what? unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Remember what Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 13, verse number 1. The powers that be are ordained of God. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, what did he say? We have responsible as believers to submit to kings and to governors and all that are in authority. He tells us that there. Hey, preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say what the Holy Spirit was trying to speak through Luke in, in, in all throughout the book of Acts to point out that you and I are not insurrectionists. We are not to be rising up against the government. That's not our responsibility. We have a responsibility to be law-abiding citizens. That's the responsibility we have. And, and only when we live in a place, in a society that makes laws that violate the laws of God... Do we have the right to choose to obey God or man? And by the way, that's the exception. That's the exception. And of course, when that comes up, we should always choose to obey the Lord. And that's happened before, of course. And we have that responsibility. Judges, like we've seen in the book of Acts, Galileo, Sergius Paulus, Felix, you know what they did with every person that stood before them? They had to do what Pilate did with the Lord Jesus. I find no fault in them. Every one of those Christians, what were they? They were exonerated. They were exonerated. Luke made it clear for everybody who would read the book of Acts through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, 
particularly in those early centuries of Bible Christianity, that Christianity is not some political insurrectionist movement. It's not there to overthrow the government. Now, what does uh, Felix take away from all this? Uh, look in Acts chapter 23, verse number 29. Acts 23, 29. Notice what the Bible says here. This is the letter that Claudius writes to Felix. And he says in Acts 23, 29, when I, whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law. He's talking about Paul. He was accused of questions of Jewish law. But to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. What's he saying? I can't find anything wrong with this guy. I, I can't find anything wrong with Paul. And so <laughs> what is Felix's initial response to what these are bringing these accusations, what Tertullus is saying, the accusation that's bringing, no doubt in Felix's mind, who's he going to believe? Is he going to believe these Jews who they of themselves are riotous and he knew Jerusalem was a powder keg, he understood all of that, am I going to believe Ananias, who's a corrupt guy to begin with, and uh, these religious officials, or I'm, am I going to believe my own chief captain back in Jerusalem? Well, I think to me it's pretty obvious the guy wouldn't be a chief captain. He wouldn't, Felix wouldn't have appointed him in that place had he not trusted him. And so no doubt he's going to listen to this letter and he's going to understand that what these Jews are bringing, these accusations, in all likelihood are going to be what? False. They're going to be a lie. They became very vague in their charges. They couldn't, he, he couldn't enter in what he was saying, what Tertullus was saying, that couldn't enter into evidence. There were no specifics. Everything was spoken in generalities. That was the, the treason part of it. Then what about, what about the next part? Look at verse 5 again of Acts chapter 24. And notice he says here about him, he was a ringleader, Paul, of the sect of the Nazarenes. Well, now he uses this term Nazarene. Interesting. That term Nazarene was... Associated with who? It was associated most often with Jesus. He was called the what? The Nazarene. And so they take that term, and that term is not a term to be thought well of. That was a term of derision. It was kind of like the term Christian. Uh, uh, the term started because Jesus was from Nazareth. He was called the Nazarene, and people who identified with Jesus came to be known as Nazarenes. You remember... You remember there in John chapter 1, and you remember when they came to Nathanael, and they told Nathanael, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. You remember what Nathanael said? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Hey, this wasn't a term to be endeared to. In other words, Nazareth was considered to be the hicks, the sticks, the out-of-the-way people the people who didn't know much. And when the people who followed Jesus Christ were called Nazarenes, what was that? That was, a, that was really it was a slur for that day and that time. Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth six times in the book of Acts. But this is the only time in the book of Acts that his followers were called Nazarenes here. Popular term. Tertullus, no doubt, he used it because he knew Felix would associate with it there that Felix would understand the meaning. And so he says that this guy's a ringleader of that sect of the Nazarenes. Now, you have to understand, when he says sect, there were different messianic sects that were going on there. Uh, some who did believe that Jesus was the Messiah and others who didn't. And Nazarenes would have been classified with the others, those who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, by the Romans. And so immediately what they were trying to do, what Tertullus was trying to do was say, look, I want you to understand that this guy and these people are a threat to you. That's what he's trying to tell Felix. He's a ringleader of them. This is a threat to the Roman government. This is the offshoot of Judaism. And the Jewish leaders were accusing him, in other words, of saying, look, not only is he against Rome, but he's against Israel. He's anti-Jewish. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And then they go on, because in verse 6, they bring up this sacrilege. They said, he's gone about to profane the temple. Remember what Paul did? Remember when he got to Jerusalem? James and the others recommended that he go in 
and partake of that Nazarite vow. And when he came out, as he was coming out, you remember those Jews from Asia saw him and they immediately threw an accusation in his face that he was bringing Gentiles into the court that they weren't supposed to be in, into the inner court. And he hadn't done that. They never saw one, but they accused him of that. And they even tried to kill Paul, which was silly in and of itself because it wasn't Paul who was going to be murdered. It would have been the Gentile who would have been put to death because of that. In Acts 24, 6, what do they do? Instead of accusing Paul of bringing a Gentile into the inner court, what did they just say? Again, Tertullus speaking in what? Generalities. He's trying to profane the temple. They didn't want to bring a full-fledged accusation there. They'd back off of their original charge. Why would they back off the original charge? They couldn't prove it. They had no means of proving it. They couldn't find any witnesses. But by saying he tried to do it, there was no way to prove that he didn't try to do it. They're just throwing things out there. If it was vague enough, those Jewish leaders thought maybe it would stick. And Felix might have enough to actually come down and say we're going to execute Paul. You see, we think about that. We go back to these religious leaders because really everything Tertullus is saying is trying to prove their point. They're the ones bringing the accusations. Ananias and these elders. You know what they're really doing? They are defending every square inch of religion. They're defending every square inch of it. Do you know that religious people can very often be the most immoral and unethical people? Religious people. Many evil things have been done in the name of religion. Many evil things. As a matter of fact, I wonder how many of you, you don't raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you have ever been to try to talk to somebody, maybe in your family, maybe an acquaintance, maybe a perfect stranger, and you begin to bring up Bible Christianity and the message of Jesus Christ, and those people shut you down because they say religion is the cause of all evil in the world. They want to hear anything about it. Now, what I attempt to do is to say, you're right, religion is. That kind of throws them off when you agree with them, you know. But let me tell you something that is true. Let me tell you something that's real. Let me tell you something that's genuine. And that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not talking about religion because religion sends people to hell. We're talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, you know, we think about things that have been done in the name of religion. The Crusades... They marched across Europe to take the holy places from the Turks. And as they marched across Europe, you know what they did along the way? They slaughtered Jews along the way. In the name of what? In the name of religion. You know why they slaughtered Jews along the way? They didn't want to argue about the Holy Land when they got there. They wanted to take everything over and claim it as theirs. That's what they wanted to do. By the way, religious wars are still going on. Catholics and Protestants still killing each other, Muslims fighting against Hindus, all different types of wars going on. And we understand something about that. That is not Bible Christianity. That is not Bible Christianity. But let me ask you something. You know why our world is so confused? Because they stand back and the worst thing in the world, the worst thing in the world people can do is claim to be a Christian and live that way and act that way and do things like that. It'd be better off if they just lived as a pagan and never claimed any part of Christianity. It'd be better off. Why? Because the world likes to do this, and they don't understand. The Bible says they're spiritually discerned. They lump it all into one pot, don't they? They throw everybody all together. I mean, you think about it. You think about a place like Germany where, uh, uh, where Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door uh, that what we say began the, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, uh, but just a few years after that, about 400 years after that, that same nation decided they try to wipe out the Jewish race. And what did the world say? I thought those people were supposed to be what? I thought they were supposed to be Christians. I thought they were supposed to know something about Jesus Christ. 
You see, religious people, what am I saying? I'm saying religious people can just be as criminal as anyone else. And maybe more so when they set out to defend every square inch of their religion. And so it shouldn't surprise us when we come to Acts 24 and we find these Jewish leaders trying to defend every square inch of their religion that they possibly can. They desperately, I mean desperately, wanted Paul dead. And they'd do anything, including bring false accusations against him to see him dead. Now notice their false testimony. The Bible says, whom we took in the middle of verse 6 and would have judged according to our law. I wonder, who does the whom refer to? Well, it's referring back to the chief captain. And so Felix wants to hear the chief captain. He wants to hear Claudius' testimony. And the Bible says in verse number 22 of this same chapter, when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. In other words, Felix wasn't going to pass any judgment until he heard Claudius' testimony. He's the whom there in verse number 6. Tertullus says, I've given, you, I've given you all these accusations, sedition and violation of Roman law, violation of Jewish law, violation of God's law. I've given you all these accusations. And if you want cooperation, you call your chief captain down there in Jerusalem. You, you, you bring him up here. And we were trying to carry out our justice when he came and just snatched Paul away and commanded us to come down to you and you check with him and find out if everything is so. Well, Felix, in verse 22, we just read it. Felix says, okay, that's what I'll do. You know something, though? Felix never did it. He never cooperated with him. He never found out at all what was going on. Now look at verse number 8, the Bible, or 7, excuse me. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us with great violence, took him away out of our hands, commanding his accuser to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself May us take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. Now look at verse 9. The Jews also assented. What does that mean? They agreed, saying that these things were so. So each one of those elders that's there with Ananias, each one of those Supreme Court of the Supreme Court, here they are, and each one of them, mm -hmm, they're shaking their head. You know what each one of them did? Committed perjury. Every last one of them. They all, one after another, they perjured themselves. Because it wasn't true. They lied. And remember what they said? They said, hey, we're lovers of God. We worship God. We, we serve God. We, we love the law. Yet, in every circumstance, they blatantly lied to do what? Preserve their religion. And to execute a man they hated. But hey, we're lovers of God. We're lovers of, uh, we're, 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 we're lovers of God's law. You know that all of these accusations that we find that come against Paul, you know what they all are? They're lies. You know something that you and I shouldn't expect any less? We shouldn't expect any less. If we live a godly life in the face of an ungodly world, if we live as we ought to live as believers, then let me tell you what's going to happen. You and I, by default, as being the kind of Christian that we ought to be in pleasing Jesus Christ, we are going to make waves against this ungodly world. We're going to go against the grain. You can mark it down. Yea, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, Paul told Timothy. In other words, if you're going to live a godly life in the midst of an ungodly society, look, you should expect flack as a result of it. You should, you should expect it. Maybe If you're not receiving any flack, maybe you ought to check up on a godly life. Am I living a godly life? Notice what Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll turn just to one more place after this. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 11. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus said, hey, you're blessed. If, if, they, if they speak evil of you, if they criticize you, if they lie against you, look, your life is creating flack in this world. 
Now I want you to think about a couple things as we close. We began talking about Felix, and we also entered into that conversation, Judas. And we talked about how these, these two men were men who lost opportunity, who had great opportunity but lost opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder tonight, do you know of people, and I'm, this, is a, this is a rhetorical question, don't answer it out loud, do you know of people who've had opportunity, who've been exposed to the truth of the gospel, hey look, we all do, right? And they balk at it. I don't want to hear it. All religion's evil. It's the cause of all the wars in the world. You know what we ought to do? We ought to take the time, as we mentioned in the Sunday School Hour this morning, to pray for those individuals that they would not lose, as Felix and Judas did, that they would not lose their opportunity to receive Christ. That God would get a hold of their heart. I told you the story about my dad's uncle, be my great uncle. And he, my dad, and a friend of his who was an evangelist, they went to his door, they knocked on his door, and as soon as he opened the door, he looked square at them in the face and said, I know why you're here, and I want you to know I'm a tough nut to crack. And the evangelist looked square in my dad's uncle's face and said, that's okay. God's in the nut cracking business. You know what we ought to do? We ought to pray for those. You and I both know people who balk. We probably have uh, a close family and friends, and they balk. We don't want to hear it. You know what we ought to pray for them? Lord Jesus, help them not to lose their opportunity. Help them not to lose their opportunity. Keep the door open for them to receive Christ. Soften their hearts. Convict them of their sin. You know, there's many trials, as we talked about, of believers throughout this book of Acts. As we've been journeying through, we'll see some more. And each one of them, we said, we find out that those believers are acquitted. They're acquitted of any wrongdoing. You know what we ought to do? We ought to take time to thank God for His hand of security upon His people and how He takes care of us day in and day out. Because the devil's out to get us. The devil is out to make us disappear. The Bible says he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We ought to pray one for another for God's protection. And then I told you we'd turn to one more place. Look in 1 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Remember we said when you live a godly life, you're going to face some sort of opposition. 1 Peter chapter 4. Excuse me, chapter 3, verse number 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. What kind of response should we avoid? Well, the Bible tells us what kind of response we should avoid. We should avoid the response of being troubled and being in terror the Bible says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Not for evil, but for righteous sake. We ought to be ready to give an answer. The question is, are we responding in the right way? We need to examine the hope that is in us, that we can give a clear testimony that we suffer not for evil doing, but for doing that which is right and honoring and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the Apostle Paul's testimony in this prosecution and what was going to take place. Let's bow our heads together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to pray together in just a moment.